the topic of the lecture is poetic trauma which is also called as worse trauma let's have a look at the definition of poetic trauma poetic trauma or worse trauma is not merely a drama which is written in verse because prose may also be its effective medium it is in fact a blending of the poetic and dramatic elements in a fruitful union the poetic drama is a great achievement of the modern age it is a mixture of high seriousness and colloquial element it is the combination of the tradition and the experiment and of the ancient and the new it is symbolic and difficult its verse form is blank verse or free verse in short its vehicle is verse its mechanism is imagery its substance is myth and its binding force is musical pattern blank verse or free verse means an unrhyming verse so the poetic drama is a kind of drama which is composed in poetic form in drama usually there are dialogues in the form of normal sentences but in poetic drama they are replaced by verse by poetry so here poetry is an integral part of the play that is supposed to be twined with the plot character and their interplay in a very smooth manner sustaining the poetic grace and intensity its themes and characters should be poetically convinced and should be larger than the average humanity and humdrum monotony of daily life the passions and emotions for meeting them should be naturally productive of the poetic expression calculated to lift the mind of the spectator above the sphere of our ordinary joys and sorrows and send the penetrating penetrating gaze of his inner vision far down below the surface of life to the very springs of human action and human drives moreover its practitioner must combine mastery over the poetic resources with a real understanding of the peculiar needs and modes of the dramatic representation in the theater the history of the poetic drama in england is littered with the prose and anatomies of poetic plays written by the distinguished poets of uh, the 19th century who failed to subordinate poetry to the general dramatic spirit and adapt the plays to the conditions and requirements of the stage so having said this the real challenge for the playwright while creating a poetic drama is that the dramatic elements of it must be capable of sustaining the poetic grace and intensity which means that its themes and characters should be having the poetic elements as a core and here are a few things enlisted which the playwright needs to consider like it should the play should sound like something more than monotonous normality of daily life and the passions and emotions portrayed through the characters should be something above and beyond our ordinary emotions of the happiness and sadness that we experience in our day to day life and thirdly instead of having the surface level portrayal of the ideology that is meant to be presented through the story of the play it should convey the far deeper inner version of it let's have a look at the background of poetic drama poetic drama reached its glorious peak in elizabethan england when the general conditions of society and richness of language combined with the whole nation's craving craving for amusement and edification and the writer's intimacy with the theater to make us make the stage a national institution but the glory did not last long and its decline was precipitated by the victory of the puritan fanaticism which sounded its death knell when it was revived again in the restoration era the conditions had changed and the heroic tragedy in rhyming couplet was simply the fury and the violence of its ghost a sort of artificial respiration was given to it as the blank verse tragedies which followed 
they however failed to sustain its life and with one flash of life in otway's venus preserved it gave up the ghost so venus preserved is actually a popular tragedy a dark masterpiece by thomas otway the 18th and the 19th century contributed little to the development of poetic drama due to the unfavorable conditions there were signs of rebirth of this drama by 1920 but it could not gain much ground the reason was that most of the dramatists of this period were interested in realistic drama a change was noticed with the passage of time the disciples of ibsen began to be overshadowed at the abbey theater Yeats tried to revive poetic drama, but he could not succeed much. It was T. S. Eliot who firmly established it. He prepared the concrete ground for it by saying that the craving for poetic drama is permanent in human nature. He also added that poetry was the complete medium for drama. So, as it's mentioned about the disciples of Ibsen, disciples means students or followers. so one of the most famous disciples of ibsen was george bernard shaw who shared his unbashed intellectualism and his concern with contemporary social issues in the 19th century many efforts by the great poets were splendid failures on the big commercial stage for which the writers themselves were partly to blame because they could not rise above the slavish imitation and adaptation of the elizabethan blank verse tragedy to reorient the poetic drama to changed conditions of society and the taste and sensibility of the spectators so uh, for the failures that were being produced in that age the authors themselves were to be blamed for this to some extent because uh, they were unable to come up with some new stuff some creative stuff and they were just blindly following the the blank verse pattern that was being popular in elizabethan age uh, and uh, as mentioned here about the blank verse which was the basic pattern of language in shakespeare's plays the tragedies that he wrote so the authors still were blindly following that which couldn't earn them much popularity in the early years of the 20th century english drama under the influence of ibsen shaw and galsworthy was too realistic and too involved in contemporary social problems to be tolerant of any poetry least of all poetic expression a few early 20th century dramatists like stephen phillips did write poetic drama in the later years of the century thanks to yeats bottomley and most of all ds eliot poetic drama came to its own once again and could thereafter compete with prose drama so the ones mentioned over here ibsen shaw and galsworthy they are actually known for raising the the social issues the social problems that are uh, going on in the society so as as ibsen is very much popular for challenging the stereotypical gender roles and the conflict between motherhood and profession and the alienation of a single career woman and such sort of issues similarly galsworthy plays are actually called the problem plays and uh, shaw is also known for highlighting the issues of um, uh, um, that revolve around marriage and uh, equal rights for men and women prostitution and its reasons and uh, relationships and many other social issues so having such sort of trend uh, literary trend going on it was really hard for everybody to to accept something as light or as unreal as poetry but then there were some playwrights who came up with creative stuff and who wrote poetic drama 
reaction against the naturalistic trauma. In the 20s of our century, there is a clear evidence of a marked reaction against the naturalistic trauma of the earlier years. There is conversely what Allardyce Nickel in British trauma calls a renaissance of imagination. The ascendancy of imagination and the challenge to realism took in the field of drama three divergent directions as below. First one, the establishment of poetic drama. Second one, the coming into its own of the modernistic continental school. Third one was the arrival of the historical dramatists. So the poetic drama was actually a reaction against the prose plays of Shaw and others which showed a certain loss of emotional touch with the moral issues of the age. Yeats did not like the harsh criticism of the liberal ideas of the 19th century at the hands of revolutionary dramatists like uh, Shaw. And he felt that in the past, people had a higher tradition of civilization than in their time. So the drama of ideas was failing to grasp the realities of their age. On the other hand, the drama of entertainment or what you can call the artificial comedy was becoming more and more dry and uninteresting. So the tradition of realistic drama needed a boost. And under, under such circumstances that uh, it happened that some modern writers who were actually known as poets, who had made their reputation as poets, they made an attempt in the 1930s and 40s to revive the tradition of the poetic drama, which actually had been dead since the restorations period. So they actually made an attempt and came forward with their own creative poetic dramas. Beginners, before T.S. Eliot, some dramatists tried to create a taste for poetic drama. This attempt helped Eliot in making his valuable experiments in poetic drama. Among these dramatists, Stephen Phyllis, John Maysfield, Gordon, Bottomley, Flecker, and John drink water are important. They all experimented in poetic drama and prepared ground for Eliot. Hence their plays vitalized the course of poetic drama. The modern poetic drama in England owes its steady development to Gordon Bottomley, Abercrombie, T.S. Eliot and W.H. Auden. So usually it happens that uh, only Eliot is regarded as the, the only proponent of poetic drama. And it's frequently mentioned that it was only he who established its tradition in 20th century and propounded the theory of the poetic drama. But here, as you can see, there are some names mentioned. And you can see that there were others too who set the foundation for Eliot to build on. Stephen Phillips. So even before this renaissance of imagination, uh, there were some uh, dramatists who actually started writing verse drama in the early years of the 20th century. And Stephen Phillips was one of them. So that's why he actually deserves the first mention. And that is the reason he is mentioned first. Paolo and Francisco was his greatest achievement, though he wrote some other worst plays also, like Herod, Ulysses, The Sin of David, and Nero. Unlike T.S. Eliot, he does not try to subject an old traditional style to the needs of the modern age. He, says Nickel, looks backward and can think of nothing to save the continents of the worn out 19th century styles based on uncritical admiration of the Elizabethans. So writing or creating a poetic drama was not enough because the writer or the dramatist was supposed to adapt it uh, to the, the contemporary requirements of the viewers. But Phillips kind of failed to do so because he was blindly following 
the blank verse style that was popular in Elizabethan age, as uh, I mentioned in the previous slides, and as it's mentioned here by a critic that the continuance of the worn out 19th century styles, as the other dramatists were doing so and they failed to produce some major hits, same was the case with Phillips. So, although his uh, plays did dazzle uh, his contemporaries at least for a time, but they could not succeed in creating an appreciable public demand for poetic drama. So it wasn't really a great commercial hit. Coming towards his followers, nor did he found a tradition, though some dramatists like Rudolf Bezier and G. E. Flecker tended somewhat in his direction. Bezier's The Virgin Goddess is written much in the same style as Phillips. Flecker's Hassan is different in the sense that it is related to the Middle East. It does capture much of the gorgeous splendor of the East with its hedonistic lustfulness and grotesque statism but its characterization and incidents, mostly of the melodramatic kind, are being crude and incapable of interesting the most discerning of readers and spectators. There is some really splendid poetry also, no doubt, but to quote Allardyce Nicol, it is a mere patchwork of heterogeneous elements without harmony and without form. John Maysfield was influenced a great deal, especially in his later dramatic work by the Japanese drama, which was introduced in English for the first time in 1930. In the beginning, Maysfield tried his hand at domestic and historical themes in such plays as The Tragedy of Nan, the prose play, The Tragedy of Pompey the Great, and Philip the King, which was written in heroic couplets. The Japanese influence is perceptible, first in the faithful. His later plays, mostly on religious and historical themes, show an appreciable evidence of the Japanese influence. Good Friday, A King's Daughter, The Trial of Jesus, Tristan and Isolde, and The Coming of Christ are his important later plays. In them, he skillfully combines prose and verse, and following the precedent of the ancient classical stage introduces choral interludes. His language is well root but lucid. Well root means it was according to the particular time or era in which he was writing, but lucid, which means it still was very much intelligible, understandable, it was very much clear. So apart from his inspiration that he um, drew from the Japanese drama, another thing worth mentioning is that his Christianity is uh, quite conventional. That was very much prominent in his plays. And it was not very much acceptable to the moderns. And another thing worth noticing is that... Uh, when you come across his play, there is a childlike quality in um, in his conception and presentation of the ideas um, in his plays, which cannot go unobserved. John Drinkwater. His poetic dramas came only before 1918 and which include The Storm, The God of Quiet, and X equal to zero, A Night of the Trojan War. The Storm is indeed very effective and puts one in mind of Saints Riders to the Sea, which is another popular play by another writer. A young woman is waiting fearfully for her husband who has been overtaken by a furious storm. Her mind, torn between hope and fear, comes to a settlement with the bringing in of the dead body of her husband. 
The play is meditative rather than expressive of action. The storm in the soul of the young women going to be bereaved is given more importance than the physical storm raging outside her cottage. Her tragedy, which she takes with an agonized silence, is really pathetic and heart wrenching. X Zero attempts a smart exposure of the evils of war. Even the most expensive war yields no profit in the end. It comes to zero. Drinkwater has presented in the play an imaginary episode during the course of the Trojan War. The chief characters of the play are four, two Trojan friends and two Greek friends. At night, one of the Trojans leaves his friend behind to kill some Greek staggler. And likewise, one of the Greeks goes to ambush some unwary Trojan. The Greek and the Trojan left behind happen to become the victims. It is discovered by the Greek and the Trojan assassins when they come back from their respective errands. Drinkwater, aware as he was of the tragedy of war, was not yet a pacifist, as his Abraham Lincoln shows. Lincoln turned to war when things went out of hand, though he did so with a deep spiritual agony. So he does have his fair share in the efforts that were made to re-establish the poetic play in in his earlier career. And uh, although we are not concerned with the prose plays here, but um, Abraham Lincoln, as mentioned in the last line, was his most popular prose historical drama, which actually secured for him international fame. And although the plays, his poetic dramas that are mentioned here, they were not as popular as Abraham Lincoln and even his other historical dramas like um, Mary Stewart or um, Oliver Cromwell, uh, they were not even, the poetic dramas were not even uh, popular as those, but they still helped to promote and preserve the vogue of poetic play. So they, so, you know, he does contribute it. Yeats and the Irish Movement. The leaders of the Irish movement were W.P. Yeats and Senge. Their followers were many and included some very talented writers. Yeats' plays were full of rich symbolism, mystic esotericism, and delicate refinements which characterized much of his poetry. His was, say, Moody and Lovett. The first dramatic verse since Jacobian days that was really related to human impulse and expression and was not a mere decoration. He took the new Anglo-Irish poetry with its tendency towards rhetoric and its gleams of racial imaginativeness and he gave it an aesthetic form that was to be the greatest influence on the next generation of Irish writers. The Countess Kathleen, which came towards the end of the 19th century, the land of heart's desire, the kind's, the king's threshold on Bailey's strand, and Deirdre and his chief plays. For sheer poetry and emotional effectiveness, the Countess Kathleen occupies the most prominent place. It is the story of a Christ-like Countess who offers her own soul for hell in return for the release of many others. On finding her dead, even the unsophisticated peasants express themselves poetically. A peasant, she was the great white lily of the world. A peasant, she was more beautiful than pale stars. An old peasant woman, the little plant I love is broken in two. The Irish movement actually contributed a lot to English drama in general, because both um, for prose and verse. 
and the Yeats and Sinch, they together established the Abbey Theatre in Dublin to encourage the poet come playwrights. And at this theatre, Yeats tried to revive poetic drama. And he wrote about 26 plays in verse, but still he was more of a poet than dramatist. And his plays are so rich in poetical intensity that even Eliot and others have praised his contribution to poetic drama. And his plays actually had uh, the, the pure poetic taste because they were poetic not only in form, but spirit also. And the Countess Kathleen is the most popular one among all others he wrote. Lascelles Amber Crombie. Amber Crombie's first plays like Deborah, The Adder, The End of the World, Staircase, The Deserter, and Phoenix struck a note of departure from the fanciful and symbolic plays of Yeats. A note of departure from the fanciful is being said because Amber Crombie had nothing to do with the land of fairies or mysticism. Although he was a poet, no doubt, but he was also a realist. And he took upon himself the task of adapting the blank words of the Elizabethan age to the events of the modern times that required some modern solution. So his plays were also criticized by the critics for having poor characterization and poor stage effects. But still, if he's compared with Stephen Phillips' unthinking Elizabethanism, so in that case, he still, Abercrombie is still regarded as the one showing a much greater awareness of contemporary taste and contemporary conditions, unlike uh, Stephen Phillips, who just blindly followed the Elizabethan blank verse style. Referring to Abercrombie's work, Moody and Blovett man maintained, Fundamentally, Abercrombie endeavored to bring his poetry into close contact with reality. He was not another singer from fairyland, as was Yeats. He deliberately departed from the Elizabethan tradition, which kept so many writers of the past in its thraldom. Consciously, he sought to find a form of blank verse expression which might adequately convey to modern spectators or readers the immediate emotions of our times in terms of poetry. The powerful resonance of his verse with its peculiar welding of highly imaginative language and common expressions presents a notable contribution to dramatic form. Bottomley's plays can be roughly divided into two groups as follows. First one is the earlier group and the second one is the lyric choral plays. What attracts our attention in the plays of the earlier group is the solidity of Bottomley's characterization and his pleasing inventiveness. These plays include some with Shakespearean themes such as King Lear's Wife and Grash which are extremely interesting. Crash tries to show the background of Lady Macbeth and succeeds in convincing us psychologically. In the choral plays, Bottomley further removed dramatic dialogue from common speech. His experiments are quite interesting even though he could not excite much emulation. Whereas Abercrombie tried to poetize the ordinary speech and also 
to combine poetry with realism bottomly actually endeavored to make an altogether new start and he was in search for a new poetic medium so for that reason he did not turn to the elizabethans or the victorian imitators that's where his main inspiration lies that is in the no drama of japan and the classical drama of greece but he was not inspired by the elizabethan or the victorian writing styles T.S. Eliot had been the greatest shaping force in the literature of the 20th century in poetry, criticism, and drama. Long before he came forward with a poetic play of his own, he had started defending poetic drama. In The Possibility of Poetic Drama, The Need for Poetic Drama, Aims of Poetic Drama, and Poetry and Drama, he strongly advocated the cause of poetic drama. At one point, comparing prose and verse as the media of drama, he conveyed his belief that poetry is the natural and complete medium of drama, that the prose play is a kind of abstraction capable of giving you only a part of what the theater can give, and that the verse play is capable of something much more intense and exciting. He wrote some seven poetic plays which are Sweeney Agonistes, The Rock, Murder in the Cathedral, The Family Reunion, The Cocktail Party, The Confidential Clerk, The Elder Statesman. Of all of them, Murder in the Cathedral is the most outstanding one. Bamber Gascoigne observes in 20th century drama, it is the highest tribute to a poetic drama to say, as one can of murder in the cathedral, that it is both intensely dramatic and inconceivable in prose. Eliot's plays are quite complex, just like his poetry, but they are satisfying in their poetry and the evocation of the desired moods by a wonderful handling of the verse medium. So as mentioned in the previous slide that uh, Eliot has been verbally pleading the case of poetic drama, but all this verbal pleading would have been of no use if he himself had not, with his own practice, proved the potentialities of poetic drama in the modern age. So he actually did that by writing these poetic plays and uh, the murder in the cathedral was the most popular one and it was his first full-length poetic play and uh, through these plays through this and other plays of him he actually discarded the use of traditional blank verse which was being used by some other playwrights and he also very carefully and consciously avoided any sort of echo of shakespeare so he consciously did that. And he also explored the dramatic possibility of verse. And he actually extended the scope of poetic drama. That's why he is being given the credit for it. Cinch created the riders to the sea and the playboy of the Western world whose vitality and permanence of appeal remain unaffected by familiarity and the corrosion of time. The first play is brief and local in its attachment, but the awful stoicism of the old mother, which means patience of the old mother, who has been deprived of all her sons and breadwinners by the voracious and inexorable sea, reaches a height of dignity which has not been equaled by any play of the present century. Here, realism, folklore, and crude materials of everyday life are woven into a dramatic symphony which grips the attention with the first dialogue and keeps the imagination captivated and entranced till the last utterance of bereaved motherhood, ringing the light of hope 
from the universal darkness which has enveloped her life so sinj as also mentioned earlier is another important name in the history of poetic drama and he especially uh, committed to the creation and propagation of poetic drama and not only for poetic drama but he also contributed immensely to the development of irish school of imaginative plays so he is another important one then we have christopher fry christopher fry in his poetic plays imported some mystical suggestions and philosophical speculations for this very purpose he preferred verse to prose his verse is quite suggestive but is sometimes marred by a little immaturity and incomprehensibility so the quality of his verse is actually uh, you can say ruined or compromised or spoiled by the immaturity or the incomprehensibility as pointed out by the critics and here is an example given uh, given to consider to show both his excellence and weakness the world is an arrow of lark song shot from the earth's bow and falling in a stillborn sunrise christopher fry and another author that i mentioned in the previous slides stephen phillips they both have a thing in common between them that they both affect a glamorous poetic style which is at once attractive and thrilling but the first impression that they create does not last very long because this glamour of language and rhythm is actually not supported by the real blood and flesh of drama it um, usually has just poetry without any dramatic backbone and a dramatic backbone actually needs to have the essence of literature which demands the depth the vitality of the human life and human experience and christopher fry and stephen phillips dramas were criticized for lacking the actual essence of drama then we have stephen spender stephen spender with the trial of a judge came out with a powerful poetic play depicting the fate of liberals and socialists in the nazi germany of hitler this play as nickel points out despite its brilliance in execution exhibits a burning emotion so consuming as to destroy that simple structure from which a stage play must be built so he is just another great modern poet who has written poetic plays and the one mentioned here the trial of the judge was his most important play the judge the hero of the play tries to administer justice impartially between the fascists and the communist but the fascists who are in power charge him with communistic leanings and he is disgraced imprisoned and killed the judge who stands for abstract justice is a dignified figure he embodies in himself permanent human values the rhetorical tendency of spender's poetry helps him in conveying the emotional tone of the character speaking under stress of strong feeling on account of these reason the trial of a judge is one of the most effective pieces of poetic drama in the modern age w h auden and christopher isherwood Auden wrote two plays alone and three plays in collaboration with Isherwood. Isherwood's plays deal with symbolic situation and cartoon characters most of the times. One of their important plays is The Dog Beneath the Skin, which is a gay 
satirical farce. On the other hand, the ascent of F6 and across the frontier are serious plays dealing with modern problems through symbolism. They both have uh, not only written the prose plays, but they have also written the verse plays. And when they both worked together and wrote together, so Auden actually contributed the verse chorus and Isherwood actually added the crisp and neat prose dialogues. So that's how they both worked together and came up with interesting and creative stories. And they wrote both humorous and serious kind of plays as the one mentioned first. The first one is actually uh, a satire or a comedy. And the other two are actually serious plays um, addressing some very serious problems, modern problems. And lastly, we have these references that I used. Thank you very much.